Good morning, everybody. You glad to be in God's house today? Amen. We find strength. Hallelujah. We find strength to face the day. Presence for our fears that are washed away. When we see you, when we see you, we find strength. Strength to face the day.
Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, God. This is a beautiful chorus we learned a couple weeks ago. And it just says, you are worthy of it all. Do you agree with that this morning? He is worthy of all the praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. Let's sing it. You are Praise the Lord. <laughs> Isn't God good? I'm thinking about everything that's going on in the world today, and uh, ah, it's crazy. But um, just knowing that uh, we have a God who loves us so much, so, so much. And um, I'm learning more and more about what that means. And um, it's very comforting in a crazy world. I was uh, taking a taxi home yesterday and the Uber driver was concerned about this and that and the other. And he was talking about the coronavirus and everything. And, and this is crazy and that's crazy. He went on and on and I was telling him, yeah, but that's why I'm so happy I have Jesus because I don't really worry. I don't worry. We don't know where or who has the virus and you're going to drive yourself crazy wondering when and how and all these things but that's what we have when we have Jesus you know you have a comfort and a and a hope and you just have this this knowledge at least I hope we do you just have this sense of peace and security in him and not so much in all the stuff that's going on and I am so so grateful for the Lord I mean Oh, I'm so grateful for Jesus. <laughs> yeah, he's so good. He's so sweet, so kind, so loving, so patient. And I am so grateful. And um, I'm telling you, with everything that's going on, I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than any and everything this world has to offer. Praise the name of the Lord. <laughs>
the Bible says there's a time for everything under the sun. And in the same meeting, we take an offering, we hear the word of God, we're rejoicing, we're praising, and yet there are people that bring burdens into the church. And that's why God said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. So this morning at nine o'clock, I shared with the church that a longtime friend of our church, Morris Chapman and I talked, we hadn't talked for years, and he's, um, going through a battle with cancer. He lives out in Las Vegas. And I stood proxy for him here today. And the pastor stood for different needs that we're facing as a church. And a whole bunch of people came forward as the choir sang this song that simply says, pray. In the middle of the night, a couple of years ago, my wife got this song from the Lord and she just jumped out of the bed and taped it so she wouldn't forget the melody and the words and it's blessed a lot of people. And I want you, if you're here in the balcony or downstairs, and you came in with a burden, I know you're praising God, but you've got a problem that you know only God can solve. You've got a heavy-duty burden that you carry. We've all had burdens, haven't we? A wayward son or daughter or something pressing on us that you know only God can do that. Well, that's why the Bible says pray. God will promise, he has promised, he will answer when you, what? Pray. Don't feel sorry for yourself. There's no promise for that. Don't cry over it. But pray. Give it to God. Transfer that thing to God. So if you're here this morning and you have something that you want to give to God, Pastor, it's a burden. Come down from the balcony. Come down quickly from downstairs. Just get up if you have that. Walk right up here and stand in the front. Come on, thank you. Come Come, just God's going to see that you have faith and you're going to give it to him. You come right up and you sing along, pray along with this, right to the edge facing me. Thank you. God's seen every tear, heard every prayer. Just before we move to another part of the meeting, look up at me, please. I want to give a, a praise report. Um, how many years ago was that, Carol, that we got a call to do a concert at Angola Prison in Louisiana? Um, and we met um, in, in an amazing situation, over 5,000 inmates, and uh, um, average sentence, 91 years. Very, very serious criminals. And there was a revival that broke out. And they estimate that there's between 1,000 to 1,500 Christians now in that prison because of the gospel. Well, we met seven or eight of them that became friends with me. They were featured in a video involving the singers and our trip there. I've been back along with other pastors repeated times. And one of the guys that was in there was a guy named Ron Olivier. And because he was charged with his crime before he was uh, 18 and put in, uh, he got time served and was released after 30 some years. And he came here and visited with his wife. Do you remember Ron Olivier, any of you? And they just had their first baby about two weeks ago. He has a little boy. So we're so happy for that. Yeah, let's thank God for that. He'll come back and visit us. But on Monday, I got the call of all calls because there's a guy in there older than Ron who had served 41 years on a non-murder charge. Uh, and he had come up for parole and we were all praying for him, Sidney Deloge, and my friend Terry Vander A, who works in Christian ministries involving prison, had really be, been an advocate, appeared at the parole hearings and nothing happened and then out of nowhere one thing led to another and the governor just signed a release and on Monday after 41 years and he's a pastor in that prison he's one of the prison uh, inmate pastors Sidney Deloche is free 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 and right now he's with his daughter who was four years old when he went in. She's 45, has a PhD, working in the correction facility, 
and um, uh, in the uh, in that uh, correctional work in Louisiana. So he's bonding with her. I've talked to him two, three times. He spoke a little bit of Carol on the speakerphone. He's so happy. We're letting him just get settled and bonded. Imagine for 41 years, he's never handled a dollar bill, never touched anything, totally institutionalized. But he told me on the phone, listen, pastor, remember God set me free long before I got out. He set me free in Jesus. So he's going to come up here in April, May, God willing, give his testimony, but I'm just so happy. Um, Deacon Isaac Foster, come on up here quick. He's going to ask you to bless the, he's going to bless the offering. Ushers are coming. We really need your help because this offering not only pays huge overhead here, but it's going all over the world to missionaries and people. You know, a drug program just sent a, a thank you note to uh, email to me, New Life up in New Hampshire. Their roof was broken and, and, and they're doing such a great job, not only with the girls who go in there, who are uh, really been out there and they keep for over a year. They're the only program I know that takes the children too. So they have like 13 girls sometimes and 21 children. Caring, feeding, clothing, total, the whole thing. We were able to send them $10,000 to help with the roof. It's your money, you'll get the reward. But I wanna, I wanna do what Jesus did. Jesus went about doing good. How many wanna do good with your life, with your money? Come on, let's bow our heads and pray together. Hallelujah. Lord, we bless your name today. We count it a privilege and an honor to take your name upon our lips, O oh Lord. To say, Jesus, what a privilege it is, knowing, Lord, what you have done for us. You gave it all. You gave your life. You poured out your blood so that we might be set free. And today we come gladly into this house, O oh Lord, to lift our voice in praise, to thank you for your goodness, your mercy, Lord, your provisions, your protections. Father, where would we be had it not been for your grace and mercy and love for us? So today we come, Lord, with hearts filled with thanksgiving for all that you've done for us, Lord. We count it an honor to give back to you what you've given to us so freely. So Father, I lift this offering up to you, the tithes and offering of the church. God, I pray that you would bless it, multiply it, that it meets the needs of the church, oh Lord, the missionaries around the world that depends on it. Lord, we are so grateful. Bless this offering, your people, in the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. I want to talk about action and reaction today to you. I want to talk about action and then I want to talk about reaction because in life we precipitate action. We decide to say something, do something, but then other people are saying something and doing something and then we react to what they're saying and doing, correct? And the Bible has this long story. I'm going to not speed read it, but quickly read it about a trap that one of God's choicest servants fell into through action reaction. There must be something in here for us for God to take a whole chapter. The setting is the death of the prophet Samuel, who has already anointed a young shepherd boy named David to be the next king. But David is not king when this passage and this story occurs. David is on the run Probably his nerves are stressed out because King Saul, who David has been nothing but loyal and kind to, he's trying to kill him. He's chasing him all over with the army. David's in caves and hills and deserts. And now in the middle of that running around, David living with 600 men, a family too, out in Nowheresville, this happens. Look up, please. Now Samuel died and all Israel gathered to, uh, for his funeral. They buried him in the house, in his house in Ramah. Now there was a wealthy man from Maon who owned property near the town of Carmel. 
He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. That's very, very wealthy. And it was sheep shearing time. This man's name was Nabal, and his wife, Abigail, was a sensible and beautiful woman. But Nabal, a descendant of Caleb, was crude and mean in all his dealings. Goes to show you that even though Caleb, who was a mighty man of God, might have been your great, 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 great grandfather, it sure didn't help Nabal. When David heard that Nabal was shearing his sheep, he sent 10 of his young men to Carmel with this message for Nabal. Peace and prosperity to you, your family and everything you own. I am told that it is sheep shearing time. While your shepherds stayed among us near Carmel, we never harmed them. Nothing ever was stolen from them. Ask your own men and they will tell you this is true. So would you be kind to us since we have come at a time of celebration? Please share any provisions you might have on hand with us and with your friend David. David's young men gave this message to Nabal in David's name. And they waited for a reply. Who is this fellow David? Nabal sneered to the young men. Who does this son of Jesse think he is? There's lots of servants these days who run away from their masters. As if Saul was his master and David was on the run. Should I take my bread and my water and my meat that I've slaughtered from my shearers and give it to a band of outlaws who come from who knows where? So David's young men returned and told him what David had said, Nabal had said. Get your sword, was David's reply as he strapped on his own. Then 400 men started off with David and 200 remained behind to guard their equipment. Meanwhile, one of Nabal's servants went to Abigail, Abigail and told her, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, but he screamed insults at them. These men have been very good to us and we've never suffered any harm from them. Nothing was stolen from us the whole time they were with us. In fact, a day, in, in fact, day and night, they were like a wall of protection to us and the sheep. You need to know this and figure out what to do for there's gonna be trouble for our master and his whole family. He's so ill-tempered that no one can even talk to him. Abigail wasted no time. She quickly gathered 200 loaves of bread, two wineskins full of wine, five sheep that had been slaughtered, nearly a bushel of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisins, and 200 fig cakes. She packed them on donkeys and said to her servants, go on ahead, I'll follow you shortly. But she didn't tell her husband Nabal what she was doing. As she was riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, she saw David and his men coming toward her. David had just been saying, a lot of good it did to help this fella. We protected his flocks in the wilderness and nothing he owned was lost or stolen, but he has repaid me evil for good. May God strike me and kill me if even one man of his household is still alive tomorrow morning. When Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed low before him. She fell at his feet and said, I accept all blame in this matter, my Lord. Please listen to what I have to say. I know Nabal is a wicked and ill-tempered man. That's his wife, by the way. <laughs> she knew up close and personal. Please don't pay any attention to him. He's a fool, just as his name suggests. Nabal is the uh, name for uh, the word for fool. But I never even saw the young men you sent. Now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, since the Lord has kept you from murdering and taking vengeance into your own hands, let all your enemies and those who try to harm you be as cursed as Nabal is. And here is a present that I have, your servant, have brought to you and your young men. Please forgive me if I have offended you in any way. The Lord will surely reward you with a lasting dynasty, for you are fighting the Lord's battles and you have not done wrong throughout your entire life. Even when you are chased by those who seek to kill you, your life is safe in the care of the Lord, your God, secure in his treasure pouch. But the lives of your enemies will disappear like stones shot from a sling. When the Lord has done all he promised and has made you leader of Israel, don't let this be a blemish on your record. Then your conscience won't have to bear the staggering burden of needless bloodshed and vengeance. And when the Lord has done these great things for you, Please remember me, your servant. David replied to Abigail, praise the Lord, the God of Israel who has sent you to meet me today. Thank God for your good sense. 
Bless you for keeping me from murder, from carrying out vengeance with my own hands. For I swear by the Lord, the God of Israel has kept me from hurting you, that if you had not hurried out to meet me, not one of Nabal's men would still be alive tomorrow morning. Then David accepted her present and told her, return home in peace. I have heard what you have said. We will not kill your husband. When Abigail arrived home, she found that Nabal was throwing a big party and was celebrating like a king. He was very drunk, so she didn't tell him anything about her meeting with David until dawn the next day. In the morning, when Nabal was sober, his wife told him what had happened. As a result, he had a stroke, and he lay paralyzed on his bed like a rock. It says a stone, but a rock sounds better for me. About 10 days later, the Lord struck him, and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, praise the Lord who has avenged the insult I received from Nabal and has kept me from doing it myself. Nabal has received the punishment for his sin. Then David sent messengers to Abigail to ask her to become his wife. Obviously, he was a fast mover, wouldn't you say? <laughs> when the messengers arrived at Carmel, they told Abigail, David has sent us to take you back to marry him. She bowed low to the ground and responded, I, your servant, would be happy to marry David. I would even be willing to become a slave, washing the feet of his servants. Quickly getting ready, she took along five of her servant girls as attendants, mounted her donkey, and went with David's messengers, and so she became his wife. That's like the bachelor program, right? <laughs> Why all of that in the Bible? Action, reaction. Well, first of all, we focus on Nabal, and what do we learn? You can be very rich and very stupid at the same time. You can have lots of possessions and be celebrating like a king, and you can be a fool in God's sight. By the way, fool, as used in Proverbs, is never used as someone low IQ or struggling to figure things out. It's a moral term. A fool is someone who's ungodly, who won't listen to correction, won't listen to God, won't listen to people that God sends to help them. The fool can't take correction. The fool knows everything. The fool is obnoxious and rude and boastful and doesn't even realize that his life is in God's hand day by day. So Nabal is an example for us to learn that what society says is great is not always great. You can have a lot of money, be successful in business. You can be a great basketball player, a great movie actor, a dancer, an entertainer. That does not make you a nice person. In fact, you can be a low-life person. You can be a fool and yet be, have your picture in all the newspapers and have people adulating you because they don't look below the surface. But God looks at the heart. And he saw that Nabal was a fool. Unkind. Aggressive. Insulting. I would like to suggest to you that the day we live in today there's, it's like a Nabal world surrounding us. Just get in a political discussion with somebody. Nabals are everywhere. Democrats, Republicans, white, black, Latino, Asian. Nabals know no one ethnic group. Just go on social media. You want insults and arrogance? and no heart and no kindness, just go on social media, tell me what you find. Young people commit suicide because they're so shamed and attacked on social media. That's the world we live in. Am I wrong or right here? Am I? That's the world we live in. And if there ever was a moment when Christians should act different than the world, it's in this matter of Nabal. Okay, I get it. The world out there is unkind, rude, aggressive, won't take correction, knows everything, obnoxious, no social filter, insulting people and thinking it's cool, blow, losing their temper and going off on people, mocking people, 
Who is David? I don't have to worry about David. Why should I give any food for him? Greedy, selfish. You know, Paul says that in the last days, 2 Timothy, third chapter, in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. Listen, lovers of money, lovers of self, angry, boastful, discourteous, having a form of godliness. These people go to church, but don't know anything about the power of Jesus Christ. And that's why I want all of us, I mean, to look into our own hearts. How do people see you? Nabal's servants knew what he was. His own wife knew what he was. He was a fool, obnoxious, impossible to be around. How do people look at you and me? Not not what you think of yourself. How do people look at you? I'm asking all of you to think of that. In other words, when they leave you, Well, how do people talk about you behind your back? Do they find you kind and polite, interested in their life? Or is it all about us? Oh, this is what I did. This is where I go. Look at these pictures on my phone. Me, 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 I, arrogant, proud, boastful, unkind, not giving a hoot about anyone else's life. That's Nabal. And we have to be different than that because we live in a Nabal world And we don't want to show people more Nabal. We want to show people Jesus. We want to show them kindness, gentleness, meekness. People flock to Jesus. You know why? He was nice to be around. Now the question is, are you, am I nice to be around? Some people have no friends except their own family that they cling to, and sometimes their own family can't put up with them. I know this from decades of counseling. They sow nastiness and they reap loneliness. They know everything. You can't tell them a thing. No, they know. That's Nabal. The servant said to Abigail, you better step in before something bad happens because you know our master. He won't listen to anyone. That's Nabal. That's our world today. Nobody listens to anyone. Everyone knows everything. They think their opinion is truth. And everyone has an opinion. You can have your opinion, but you can't have your own truth. Truth is different than opinion. But we live in a day, just express yourself, and anyone who disagrees with you is a devil. Uh, You're not saying amen, but... I find this very brilliant, what I'm saying right now. That's the world we live in. As I was saying earlier today, it's like Lacey, she's not there, but Lacey Ann Francis, who is my assistant now. What does she have to deal with every day? How does she talk about me behind my back? What's the report she gives? The other pastors... What do they see in me? Not just respect me because my title or I've been here for a while. No, but what do they actually see in me? What do people see in you? Do they see Nabal or do they see Jesus? Well, with all of us, we're not all like Jesus, but how many want to be more like Jesus? I mean, more like Jesus. You know the old saying, I can't hear what you're saying because your actions speak so loud. How can you be obnoxious and then witness to people. How can you be Nabal and then tell people about, oh, let me tell you about the Lord and what he's done in my life. No thanks. If this is what he produced, I'll pass. I'll try another religion. So this teaches us a lot why God takes time. That's why in the New Testament, it's always be kind, be affectionate to one another. Please listen to me. I can't do this by myself, and neither can the pastors. There's a lot of hurting people in this room right now. Forget how they look. They're covering up. They scar tissue. I was listening to National Public Radio this week, and some brilliant guy wrote a book, and he's analyzing psychologically and emotionally what's happening in our society. And he's saying, we have more money than ever before. We have more education. And he said, what are you going to do? Kids go to college. 
they're all in the medical facility wanting counseling for depression. They have more of, more of everything. But everybody's sick and lonely and hurt. Everyone. And he's saying, I, 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 we're trying to get these numbers together. People feel alienated. People feel like no one cares. People feel like no one understands them. Please listen to me. If you're a Christian, I beg you to listen to me. Please just love someone today. Be kind to someone. Find out about their life. Nabal didn't care about anybody's life. He just cared about his sheep and his goats and what he had. And he was rude and self-centered. Oh, God, help us to be more like Jesus Christ. Do I get an amen here? Can we put our hands together and say amen to that? You might save somebody from some serious stuff. They're analyzing why people turn to opioids who aren't out of it like, you know, living in, in some slum with no hope and no education. No, everybody's going to it. How empty, how hurt are people? They don't trust anyone. He was bringing out the fact that people don't trust anyone. Just, just, it's a loveless world and we gotta sow seeds of love. We gotta tell people not just about Jesus, we gotta live Jesus in front of them. And Jesus is kind. Jesus is humble. Jesus is the opposite of Nabal. So look, I'm gonna tell the truth here. I'm not saying this because I pastor here. I before God, and pastors and I talk privately about this. I have met among you some of the kindest, nicest people I've ever met in my life. You're an example to me. You humble me. I, I watch you, how you serve deacons, deaconesses, people in ministries. You, you, you're just, you're amazing. But I still think we all need that reminder. We got to be kind in an unkind world. Can I get one loud amen from everyone? We got to be. What's the sense of going to church? What's the sense of the choir going, I'd rather have Jesus. If we're going to go out and be mean, be Nabal. Oh, but my doctrine is straight. Yours is not. I don't care what you're about your doctrine. It's, are, are you loving? Are you kind? What good is anything if we're not going to be loving and kind to people? It's like a joke. Having a form of religion, but strangers to its power. But here's the reaction. Here's the trap for all of us. We're going to run into people this week or today, or you've already run into them, and they're going to act, say something, do something like Nabal did to David. So this story is really about how God saved David from his own stupidity. David killed Goliath, was anointed by prophet Samuel, was going to be the next king, and he's so special in the Bible that Jesus is not called son of Moses, he's called son of... Saul's chasing him, listen. And twice in these chapters, for Samuel, twice, David has Saul for the taking if he wants to kill him. Once Saul goes into a cave to relieve himself, David happens to be in that cave with his men, and the men say to him, God has delivered Saul into your hand. Take his life right now. David goes, no, I can't touch God's anointed. Later on, Saul is sleeping at night, surrounded by all his guards, but they're sleeping and David and his men come down. He's chasing David, trying to kill him. David comes right next to him while he's sleeping. God puts a heavy sleep, it says, on them all. And David takes his javelin and maybe his water and, and, and then gets far enough away so he can't be caught and yells back to Saul, yo, Saul, why aren't these people guarding you better? Look for your spear. Look for your water. I got it. I could have killed you. Why are you chasing me? Oh, David, my son. You know, Saul's like, he's spiritually bipolar. He's just like, I don't know what he's doing. David, my son, you truly do honor me. What am I doing? I've lost my head. I'm so sorry. And then the next day he tries to kill him again. 
David does that twice with Saul who's trying to kill him. And over a mosquito named Nabal, he's ready to ruin everything in his life because of anger. Isn't it amazing? Big things that could set us angry. Many times we look to God and God helps us and saves us from anger. But then some little inconsequential thing comes by when we're not careful and we're not uh, watching spiritually and boom, we ignite. And we say and do things that we regret possibly for the rest of our lives. You know, it's hard when you counsel people, married couples, in a fit of anger, the wife never forgets what he said because it's so vicious that she's thinking, how could he have said that? I know he was angry, but how could you go there? But that's what anger will do. Imagine David is ready, just what? He said he won't feed us? He said, who is David? Everybody, get your swords on. We're going to kill everybody. Over what? Notice the disproportional res uh, response to the insult. All right, he didn't give you food. He's a nut. His name is Nabal. What do you expect out of Nabal? But Nabal. Here's what I learned a lot of years ago. My father-in-law tried to teach it to me. I didn't see it back then. You can't take everyone serious or you're going to end up in a mental institution. Some people are Nabal. They're nasty. Do you think they're going to read to you the 23rd Psalm and give you a birthday present? No. They're going to be nasty. Why? Because they're nasty. It's not personal. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's who they are. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob could have gone to Nabal. They would have got the same response. Why? It was in Nabal. But David took it personal like we all do. What? He said, what? Give me my sword here. He said, what again? You know what? No, not only we're going to kill Nabal, all his servants too. What did his servants have to do with it? But you see how you go whack from anger. I know none of you have ever gotten angry, but I'm still preaching this just for myself. Yeah. So... So look, look, look how the disproportionality of it. He's going to wipe out everyone because he's angry. And yet God anointed him and helped him through some tough times. Oh God, help us. Don't let us go off. There's a saying in Argentina, a word I love. When someone is like a matchstick, very quick to get angry, they call him a foforito or foforita. That means a matchstick. You just rub them. How many have ever met a foforito or foforita? You don't need much. Just rub them a little bit. Wing. They're a flame. So here's David. Notice, notice how faithful God is. God sees that David is... <sighs> we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We need God every day. Someone said this about anger. Anger is like an acid that hurts the vessel that it's contained in more than where you pour it. Listen, anger is like an acid that hurts the vessel more that it lays in than where you ever tried to pour it on. And by the way, if you're angry at someone today, you have deep seething anger, you have latent anger, you have hidden anger, quiet anger, you're breathing anger inside of you. Do you think you're hurting the person you're angry with? They don't even know you're angry. In a lot of cases, you know who you're hurting? You. That's why the Bible says, put away all anger. Put away all anger. You can't have a Christian church that God will bless if there's a lot of anger around. Anger. So David is preserved by God, as I close, by God sending Abigail. You go, girl. Abigail is, Abigail's okay. How many say amen? She has much more sense and wisdom than David. David is just, he's a foforito. He just went off. 
Just think what he was about to do. Kill people and children would have no longer have a father. Over what? Over what? But that's like us. Over what? Think of some of the things that have happened in our life. And we've said and done things that we regret the rest of our life because of anger. Oh, anger is, anger is bad. I'm telling the church, there's things of anger. You can get angry so quick that it's, it's, it's frightening. A lot, a lot of years ago, I was playing a game, basketball game, in front of thousands of people and on TV all throughout New England. And some ministers from a certain organization knew about me that I had grown up in church and that I was a professing Christian. And they said, could you get us tickets? We'll, we want to see you play. And we're playing a big game against UConn. I was playing at University of Rhode Island. And, and afterward, we'll take you out to eat because you're a fine young Christian man and all that. So we're playing the game. There's only like a minute and a half left. We're up, but there's a loose ball. I'm racing for the loose ball. The other guy's racing for it. It's going out of bounds. I'm elbowing him. He's elbowing me to try to get inside position to knock the ball back. And we both fly out of bounds and fall into the crowd. Fraternity guys from, from URI. And out of nowhere, we just tumble into them. And he just turns, no warning, punches me right in the jaw. Sucker punches me. And you know how I responded? I said, I bless thee, my brother, for thou hast punched me in my mouth. No. A light went on inside of me, never before or never since did I ever know rage like that. I didn't want to just punch him. I wanted to destroy him. I'm telling you the truth. It can come like a flash fire. Am I correct or not? I started, I had to hit him, but now everyone's there. This is the truth. The team bench is emptied. The fans went onto the floor. The state troopers had to come out to restore order. <laughs> and I'm just wanting, and everyone's holding me. I remember my jersey being pulled. I'm just a total rage. And I'm trying to hit him. And I take a swing, a wild swing, and miss him and hit the referee who was separating it. I hit the referee on the side of his neck. And he turned to me. He had reffed a lot of our games and said, Jimmy, what's wrong with you? Nuts? What'd you punch me for? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the game, we won. I didn't play the rest of the game. Yeah. You're going to make me angry. You keep clapping. And I'm up in the locker room. We're celebrating. Shower, get our clothes on. They come to me. Hey, Jim, there's two, like, ministers downstairs waiting for you to hear my testimony about how I serve Christ. <laughs> the Lord is listening to me. No. Tell him I can't meet him. Too ashamed. That's what anger will do, am I correct? I don't, wanna, I don't wanna have outbursts of anger. You know what anger will do? Next to last verse, just look at James. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. How many want God to save you from angry outbursts, angry words, angry actions, angry actions? You hear this all the time? I just saw another one. I, I don't even like to talk about these things or see them. Someone, you know, the g woman has a child. The father wants rights. She won't let him see the kid. She's worried about him. So he shoots her. Why not? Just angry. Shootings, angry. Most shootings, most murders have the root of it, anger. Which has 
turned into hate. The only cure for it is God's love possessing me. Because here's what God's love will do. Don't try to deal with your anger. Let God deal with your anger. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, and I'm done. Love is patient. Mm. Love is kind. Love in Jim Simbola does not envy. He won't boast. Love in him will not make him proud. It does not dishonor others. That means it's not rude. When you see a rude person, that's someone who's not being controlled by God's love. It's not self-seeking, selfish. These two, not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrong. In other words, people have hurt that person, but God's love makes them, nah, let's forget it. I'm not going to keep it in that black book anymore. Wouldn't it be nice if God helped us all to throw away all of our black books? Do I get a witness here in the church that we can just let it go? In the name of Jesus. Close your eyes, please. Oh, Lord, thank you for your word. I need your word. If you're here today and this word was specially for you because of some actions done against you that it's hard to deal with it. Just lift your hand up. Just put your hand up. You don't have to stand up or anything. Just lift your hand up and then put it down. God will see it. God's going to help you. Of course he will. Lord, make us kind. In a world filled with the spirit of Nabal, arrogance, boasting, meanness, nastiness, obnoxiousness. God, could you please make us st stand out because the kindness of Jesus comes through us, the love of Jesus. And Lord, keep us from angry outbursts, angry words, angry decisions. Oh God, help us never to make decisions when we're angry. That's a recipe for terrible stuff. And we're all together on this. I need you just like everyone else in the building needs you, Lord. There are people out there who try our patience. They're like Nabal. And if a great man like David got tripped up almost to the point of doing something horrible, would you please send an angel, send someone to help us when we've gone off the track and we're living in anger? Send someone and give us the wisdom and humility to listen like David listened. David could have dismissed her and rebuked her, but he listened and said, oh, I see God's using you to help me. But oh God, as I close, help us to love each other here in this building and in this church. Let the testimony of visitors be not, oh, he's this kind of preacher. The choir sings a certain way. What a nice theater they're in. No, let them leave saying, I felt God's presence and oh, look how they love each other. Because we need each other's love, Lord. We need words of encouragement. We need kindness. Living in a Nabal world, Lord, we need kindness. If there's anybody here really down and out, thinking crazy thoughts that the enemy is trying to put in their mind, we rebuke that in the name of Jesus Christ. And we ask that you'll fill them with thoughts of peace, like Jones, Joanne said, peace and joy, security. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Sing right where you are, just one time through. You are worthy of it all. Sing, everyone. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things. To you are all things. 
You deserve the glory. One more time, lift up your right hand. Just lift your right hand. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are up both hands last time. You are worthy of it all. Give him praise. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all good, and to you are all pleased. You deserve I thank you, Lord, for every brother and sister. Help us now to encourage them as we say goodbye to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today. It's been a blessing and a privilege for us to share our Sunday service with you through this webcast. It is our prayer that as the Lord is working here in downtown Brooklyn, that he will also work in the lives of each of you, no matter how near or far you may be. If you have a request for prayer, our prayer band will pray over your requests for the next 30 days. Please visit the prayer center at the bottom of our homepage, www.brooklyntabernacle.org. Click the Submit a Prayer Request button. If you would like to partner with us by making an online donation to the Brooklyn Tabernacle, please visit www.brooklyntabernacle.org forward slash giving. If you are ever in the New York City area, we would love to have you join us for one of our services. See our list of service times on our homepage. Thank you for watching and joining us in worship.